on, bud. There's a whole other world of dragons out there. Unbelievable. What do you say? What should we name it? Itchy armpit it is. So the film picks up, far, up five years later. How have things changed on the island of Burke? Is it a common place now? Yeah, I, we tried to create a, the sense of a, a dragon-human utopia, where there have been all sorts of nifty upgrades to make living with dragons fun and a little less dangerous, mm -hmm. um, mostly driven by Hiccup and his ingenuity. So I think it was, it was fun redesigning the village of Burke to be less of a, uh, a, a Viking village under attack <laughs> and much more of a, a playground for dragons and Vikings. And then uh, every, you know, every Burkean now has their own dragon, and so uh, having you know, Vikings on the backs of dragons means that the world is, is, is completely free to explore in every direction. And that's how we meet Hiccup. He's, he's out kind of pursuing his hobby of mapping the world out there with Toothless far beyond the, the known lands the, and, and into uncharted ones where he discovers a conflict that's brewing between dragons and Vikings that threatens their very relationship. <laughs> There! Come on, Toothless. Let's see what you got, bud. So Hiccup spent the whole of the first film struggling with his role as son of the mighty Sturk. What kind of character is he now? Well, Hiccup is now kind of the town hero. So having achieved all of those, those goals he had set for himself in the first movie, in an unexpected way, being that he now has his father's pride, he has the acceptance of his community, um, he even has the affection of the girl that he was pining for, uh, and he has a super cool dragon. <laughs> All of those things sort of mended Hiccup's problem in the first movie. But now, five years later, he is kind of standing on the edge of adulthood, sort of looking at the prospects that lay ahead, and they seem sort of dull and daunting, and that his father wants to sort of take over for him and step into his shoes. And he's kind of looking back longingly at the freedom and, and just j the joy that his youth has been up until this point. So it's, I think it's a coming of age. It's, it's definitely a rite of passage that so many of us have had to, had to go through, and I think it speaks on a universal level. Where have you been? Avoiding my dad. Oh no, what happened now? Oh, you're gonna, you're gonna love this. I wake up, the sun shining, terrible terrors are singing on the rooftop, I saunter down to breakfast thinking all is right with the world, and I get... Son, we need to talk. Not now, Dad. I got a whole day of goofing off to get started. Wait, okay, <laughs> first of all, I, I don't sound like that. Who? What is this character? And, and second, what is that thing you're doing with my shoulders? Yeah, okay, a, a truly flattering impersonation. <laughs> You've got Kate Blanchett joining the ensemble as Valka, a reclusive vigilante from the Arctic. What can you tell us about her role in the film? Well, Valka actually represents the thing that, that Hiccup most pines for, in a way. He doesn't quite know what it is, but there's something itching in him, some, some restlessness that seems to indicate that the answer of who he's supposed to be is somewhere out there. And when he meets this, this, this mysterious dragon rider who turns out to be his mother, it all makes sense. Suddenly, here's the other half of his soul, you know, this, this other dragon whisperer who's so much more accomplished in every way than he is who's living this life of great importance out there in the wilds, protecting dragons from evildoers and, and, uh, and having this symbiotic relationship with an entire nest of, of dragons. It seems to be what he's been looking for, only that at her core, philosophically, she, she represents something very different than, than he does. She believes in segregation of dragons to protect them because she's lost her faith in humanity. And here's Hiccup saying, no, we can all get along, you know, we can teach people to, to see the error of their ways. We can bring coexistence to the world. And that's what uh, actually creates her arc. So you said in the Q&A that the dragons are loosely based on animals. So did you bring in a zoologist or anything to help you um, from, or was it all from your knowledge and imagination? In the early days on the first film, uh, we did bring in a few experts in, in flight and um, a zoologist who talked about sort of anatomy and structure and animal behaviors. But a lot, of, a lot of the character traits that we've brought into these individual dragons kind of come from uh, part looking at the design and saying, oh, this, you know, this dragon feels like a little bit of a dump truck mixed with a, a walrus and maybe the fussy 
disposition of, of uh, you know, a, a grumpy bulldog or something. <laughs> and, uh, and so we, we kind of make our own mix of animal traits that you might recognize and then imbue that character with them in the animation. And we've done that with every character. We try to make sure that all of the dragons have unique personalities that are based on observations that we would all make, that we would know, you know, whether it be a cat in Toothless or a, or a parakeet in Stormfly or um, a walrus in Grump. You know, they all have individual personalities.